number four, praise the Savior, ye who know him. Hymn number four. taken by surprise. I should remember it, but um, the third verse is missing out of that hymn we just sang, and I always start to sing it before I realize it's not there. So let's take our Bibles now and turn to Exodus chapter 3. We're looking at the names of God, part 15. You say, that's an awful lot of sermons on the names of God. Well, yes, it's a lot of sermons from our perspective, but the name of God is infinite. And as we look at his many names in scripture by which he designates himself, it reveals to us the character and the person of Almighty God. That's magnificent. God wants us to know him. God wants us to be in fellowship with him. God wants us, as we learn more about him, to wonder in awe at his majesty and give him praise. A man who knows very little of the names of God knows very little of God. And as we've looked at our text today for these many weeks, God reveals himself to Moses in a number of different ways by his name, different aspects of his name, different works that he has done through his name, so that Moses, when he goes to the children of Israel and expresses to them the authority by which he comes, will know the name of God that is authority. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later today as we look at the next of the seven compound names of God, Jehovah Nisi, that is Jehovah our banner, but we have, for the last several weeks, looked at the first two of those names that God has given to himself and by which he is known that are compound names, many other names in scripture for God, but the compound names at which we are now looking. We've studied the first name, which is Jehovah Jireh, that is, Jehovah will see, and by implication, thus, Jehovah will provide. That's the name that Abraham called the place where God rescued Isaac from the knife of Abraham. Jehovah Jireh. Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. When God sees our need, God provides for our need. He's not merely an omniscient observer, but he watches constantly for our protection for our provision, for our discipline, and many other beneficial actions. The second name that we studied was Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth, or we might say Jehovah the doctor, 
a word that's still used in modern Israel for physicians. And we saw that in Exodus 15 and verse 26. The children of Israel have crossed the Red Sea. They're gathered on the far shore. Pharaoh's army has been drowned. And Miriam leads the women in a, a dance with timbrels and song. And part of that, as we get to the end of that passage, God speaks. And God says these words. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and wilt do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. We saw that God gave many different kinds of laws in the Old Testament that related to medicine. We looked at those, eight of the different types last week. We talked about how some of those are ritual in nature, such as the dietary laws. Paul explains that in 1 Timothy 4. We see an illustration of it in Acts chapter 10 with Peter. We see that God has blotted out those handwritings of ordinances that was against us that was contrary to us. But the focus of last week was on as Jehovah is our physician, it tells us about Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the great physician. We saw that his specific prophesied miracles were all done in his healings in the Gospels, especially in John. Those miracles prove that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, the one who is the healer. Many verses of the Gospels say that he healed those that came to him. And we read a great number of those verses last week. And we saw how many different types of diseases that our Lord Jesus healed. Jesus Christ fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, and he quoted that in the synagogue of Nazareth as referring to himself. And that's where we closed last week as Jesus was portrayed as the great physician. But we noted that the healing power of Jesus goes beyond physical, mental, and emotional disease. The most important thing it covers, it includes healing spiritual disease with forgiveness, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. We pointed out the error of the charismatic movement last week. We pointed out that Jesus chose not to heal everybody. For example, the 40-year-old man, the lame man who was in the temple every day, because God reserved that miracle of healing for Peter and John. So we're starting here with some new material this week because I want you to understand that the charismatic movement is wrong. And it is teaching some false doctrine that you need to be very careful about. There are certain contexts when sickness is brought on by sin that prayer for the sick will be answered with a positive yes answer. Not always, but in specific cases where you receive a yes answer. James chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Not let him go to a faith healer's revival where they have holy barking or some other odd thing like that. Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Notice the key elements that are found here in this passage. This is for people in the church under the authority of the elders. This is not just for scattered people wandering around out there on the street somewhere. It's not a general public healing crusade. Number two, it is the elders that are involved, not a faith healer. Number three, the faith expressed is the faith of the elders praying a prayer of faith. It's not the faith of the sick person. Many of the faith healers say, well, you know, you, you didn't get well because you didn't have enough faith to get healed. 
That's not the picture given here. Number four, the most important element is the conditional clause and the clause after it. Now I'm going to give you a very easy, very simple to understand little Greek lesson here. There are three different kinds of if clauses or conditional clauses in the New Testament. Number one is when the word used if there, and it is so indeed, if and it is in fact the case. The second way is if, and it is not so, but I'm giving you a hypothetical of what would happen if it were so. Number three, if and I don't know whether it's so or not. So what kind of conditional clause is given to us here in James chapter 5? This is the second kind that I mentioned. If and it is so indeed. If and it is so indeed. In other words, he is stating it with a conditional clause, but he is stating through the clause that this is, in fact, the case. In other words, the reason that the man in this passage was sick was because he had sinned. It was an issue of sin. It was an issue of chastening by the Lord. The sickness was a result of the chastening hand of God. His sickness is not just ordinary sickness. His sickness is not accidental. His sickness is a judgment to bring him to repentance. He's a man who realizes that unless he makes things right with God, he is going to die. The scripture speaks of a sin unto death. It teaches that we're not even to pray for someone who's committed a sin unto death. By the way, that's not the same thing as the unpardonable sin. But here is a man who is sick because of sin that he has committed. He comes under conviction and knows that he needs to repent. Notice something else that has to be a public repentance. The next verse, James 16, says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Certainly he has to confess it to the elders in this context. But verse 16 certainly implies a confession to the church. This is serious business James is dealing with here. This is not a whoop and holler evangelistic crusade that's going on. This is a condition that relates to sin in the church. And God says, I'm going to remove that man from the church because his sin is causing spiritual disaster in the church. Something else that's interesting to note here, the anointing with oil is not magic. There are a lot of people who think that you've got to have just exactly the right thing, you know? Can I use Crisco? Can I use uh, vegetable shortening? Uh, it's got to be olive oil? I mean, that misses the point. This is not some kind of a magic trick that is going on here. The anointing with oil is an external application that symbolically portrays spiritual truth. There are a number of different words that are used for anointing in the New Testament. Some of them actually mean to rub it in. And that's used, for example, of the Holy Spirit and of the Lord Jesus Christ and of God anointing us, who sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. John speaks in 1 John 2.27, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is it no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. That's actually a word for an anointing which rubs the oil in. But here we have a picture of a spiritual truth which God does in the heart of the man as he repents. Now today we move to the third of the seven compound names of God, which to me is a fascinating name, Jehovah Nisi, Yahweh Nisi. That means the Lord, our banner. We find it over in Exodus chapter 17, 8 through 15. A number of these names of God whereby it is a compound of Yahweh, Jehovah, the name that is in our text today in Exodus chapter 3, are found in the book of Exodus. Here is Moses leading the children of Israel through the wilderness, and they are beginning to understand Yahweh, Jehovah, the great I Am, the one who has brought them out of bondage in Egypt, we see a number of his compound names because he is expressing areas of his character by which he wants his people to know him. Exodus chapter 17, beginning in verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. 
And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. Remember that phrase, the rod of God. It's going to become important in just a few minutes as we understand this Jehovah, our banner with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, and you notice that's all capitals, capital L-O-R-D, so this is Jehovah, Yahweh, who is speaking here, says unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out of the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. And Moses built an altar. This is immediately after God tells him to write this in a book. Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, that is, the Lord our banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Jehovah, our banner, because God has sworn he's going to go to war. Interesting in its context, its immediate surrounding verses, a memorial in a book, God swearing that he will have war with Amalek. I think it's very fascinating, first, that God told Moses to write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Do you remember the text in Exodus that we read just a few moments ago where God declared his name Jehovah, that this is my name forever and this is my memorial? God here tells him to write it in a book for a memorial, to remember his name and Moses says, this is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner. Here we see a tie back to that memorial in chapter 3, 14 chapters earlier, as to God's name. It's almost like some of you have perhaps lived in rustic settings and you have taken a nail and nailed it into the wall and hung something on it. Even in modern settings, we do that with pictures that we hang on the wall. It's, it's a marker spot whereby we can put something that we frame that because we want to be able to see it, we want to remember it. Those of you who have been into our living room know that our walls are all covered with pictures of our children and grandchildren. We have all kinds of pictures. We had to put a nail in the wall, otherwise those pictures would not stay. They could not provide a remembrance for us. We might set them on the coffee table and then you'd have to shuffle through them. But we put a nail in and hung the picture so that there would be a memorial, a remembrance of those whom we love. You know what? God pounds nails into the walls of history where we are supposed to hang our memory. Those are nails that remind us of who God is and what he has done. These nails of memory are to remind us that there is a day of judgment and accountability coming. Scripture says so. Let me read you just five verses out of Ecclesiastes 12. The preachers sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written, it's been put into a book, was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, and now listen, and as nails fastened by the masters of assembly, which are given from one shepherd. Now, I'm jumping ahead of myself because we're going to look at <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. We're going to see Jehovah the shepherd uh, in probably next week or the week following. But who is the shepherd? I think you would all know that. The Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Every one of these points back to Jesus Christ. Every one of those names. We'll see that about Jehovah Nissi in just a second. 
God is going to bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, as we mentioned a moment ago, the name Jehovah Nisi means the Lord is our banner. The picture given in these verses is a picture of a military standard. That's a military engagement that's going on as Moses and the children of Israel are fighting against Amalek. It's a picture of a military standard leading the troops into war. God says that he himself is the banner that leads the troops into battle. That's one of the nails of remembrance given to us to know our God so that we will not be afraid. Other times in your life when you think it's just too big, the battle out there is too strong, you know, I can't, I can't stand against the forces of the world, the flesh and the devil, and you begin to backtrack and you begin to back up and, and maybe you turn tail and run. Why do we have God declaring through the words of Moses and the altar that is there built, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. It is the banner that is leading troops into battle. Do we have to be afraid behind such a commander in chief? Is there any cause for fear? Or can we be bold as we march into the battle to which God has called us? For all of us have been called, as we'll see in a moment, into a very important spiritual war. The Lord is our banner so that we will not be afraid. You may be surprised at this, but did you know that the Bible says that Jehovah is a man of war? Exodus 15, just two chapters before this. Verse 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Twice in that verse is the name Yahweh, Jehovah. The Lord is a man of war. Jehovah is a man of war. Jehovah is his name. Remember, that's the name that was given as a memorial forever back in chapter 3. How about Isaiah 42.13? The Lord, that's Jehovah again, Yahweh, shall go forth as a mighty man. He will stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. <laughs> Fantastic picture of our God. Should we be afraid when this is the one who is leading into battle? Is there any cause for worry? Is there any cause for fear? Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner. He's the standard. He's the escutcheon that goes before the troops into war. The name Jehovah, which we've studied in some detail, is directly associated with the warrior status of God and fierce battle. Do you remember how we saw the name Jehovah portrayed by our Lord Jesus Christ? Revelation 19.11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness doth he, listen, judge and make war. The Lord is a man of war. Oh, he's also a man of peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. But in certain contexts, he is a man of war. Our Lord Jesus Christ doth judge and make war. His eyes are as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Remember, we're talking about the names of God. The names of God reveal the character of God. They reveal the personality of God. They reveal the works of God. He hath a name written which no man knew but he himself and was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. The one who is riding the white stallion here, the one who is doing war against his enemies, is none other than the one whom John introduces in John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that is made. And then in verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the one who is the Word of God. 
It is the word of God who is going into battle here. And his armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. Names reveal the character and person of God. A name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jehovah, our banner. Jehovah, our standard that leads into battle. Now, what do we mean by a standard or banner in this context? I think you've probably picked it up by now, but in the ancient world and even up into modern times, troops in battle were moved across the battlefield by following a standard, a flag, a banner, an ensign, an escutcheon. When the standard tilted forward, the troops moved forward. When it dipped to the right or the left, the troops moved either to the right or to the left. When it stopped and stood upright, the troops formed a protective circle around it to take a stand against the enemy. This picture is portrayed for us in gospel songs such as Rally Round the Banner and There's a Royal Banner Given for Display. When the standard reached the objective of the assault such as the top of the hill or breached through the entrance into the enemy fortification, it was planted in the ground to show victory. I think that's graphically portrayed for us and most of you have probably seen it in that soul-stirring Iwo Jima monument in Washington, D.C., When a standard bearer was killed, another soldier would immediately pick up the standard and move to the head of the troops. Here's an important principle. Having a single principal standard to follow keeps the troops safe from confusion and destruction. It guarantees that they will single-mindedly follow their leader. From the way in which the term is used, we derive our English definitions of a standard or a banner, that which is set up and established by authority for a rule for the measure of quantity, weight, extent, value, or quality. Standard denotes a means of determining what a thing should be and applies to any definite rule, principle, or measure established by authority. Authority. Now, I've emphasized certain parts of that dictionary definition because that's how we can understand our English translations of these very important words which uncover the meaning of the Hebrew text for us. I hope you understand the reason that Moses made an altar and called it Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner, because God is the authority who has established the standard of his word. God himself is the standard. God's word expresses his character, authority, and will perfectly, and thus expresses his standard and his standards perfectly. God is the one who led them into war with Amalek. God is the one who sustained them in the war. God is the one who gave them victory in the war. The visible standard that God gave to them, which was lifted up for all to see, and which he had given them to follow was the rod of Moses. But did you know what it's called in the text? Did you notice that, the second verse of our text today? It's now being called the rod of God. When God first meets Moses in the wilderness, in Exodus chapter 3, which is where our text began today, it's called the rod of Moses. But after God empowers Moses to do miraculous things with that rod, it is called the rod of God. God took something very ordinary that was in the hands of Moses, and God transformed the ordinary into that which was extraordinary. But Moses had to yield it to God. God said, Moses, what do you have in your hand? And then God told him what to do with what he had in his hand. And it was with that rod that a serpent came. And then Moses picked it up, and he picked it up. It was with that rod that he turned the waters to blood and did many of the other miracles of the ten plagues. 
So with that rod, they held it out over the Red Sea, and it parted, and the people went through on dry land. It has become the rod of God. It is the visible symbol that God has given to the children of Israel to understand that Moses is his man, and this rod in his hand is the sign of his authority. Here we find it lifted up, and what do we find? Victory. We see it drop down, and what do we find? We find defeat. But notice something else. God told Moses to write it in a book. God has revealed himself in a book, the Bible. It is of great interest to note that the Bible calls itself the Word of God, and it calls our Lord Jesus Christ the Word of God. Jesus is himself God, but he has paralleled the living Word, Christ, with the written Word, the Bible. In the midst of a war, nobody except the enemy would dare to set up an unauthorized standard or change a standard into a pattern that was more pleasing to the standard bearer so that the standard bearer could be happy about it. He didn't like this great big thing that he's carrying around, so he decides to get a little twig with a little teeny thing on top and wave it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be stupid? Can you imagine a standard bearer doing that because he doesn't feel so good about the standard that he's got? For example, can you imagine a standard bearer changing the standard from a lion rampant to a smiley face with petunias? What would that do to the rest of the troops? It would only result in confusion and loss in the battle. The Bible makes it clear that we are in a great spiritual war and we must follow the original textual standard given to us by our commander-in-chief, Jesus Christ. People, we're in a war today that may, many of you don't even know is going on. It's a standard about Bibles. Some of you get CBD catalogs, Christian book discount catalogs. They put out an entire catalog about all the different kinds of Bibles that they sell. All kinds of different translations, all kinds of different paraphrases, all kinds of different things that are people's ideas of what they think the text ought to say instead of what it says. There's all kinds of stuff out there, and they do it, number one, to make money. They do it, number two, for some ulterior motives, like the New World Translation, Jehovah's Witness Watchtower Society, so that they can deviate from what Scripture clearly teaches. They don't want God's standard. Jehovah himself is the standard his word was breathed out by his Holy Spirit. It explains to us in human language, he who is the standard, the banner that is to go before the troops. Oh, how the enemy would like to get hold of that standard and twist it from its meaning so that the troops go in the wrong direction. And instead of attacking the enemy, fall off of a cliff and the enemy has free reign. Do you get the picture? This is why we see the name Jehovah Nissi in Scripture. The Bible clearly claims to be inspired by God. But you know that does us no good unless God has also preserved the Scriptures. You say, yes, we believe in infallible, inerrant, confluent, plenary, verbal inspiration. <laughs> and complete. <laughs> Way back then, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> So what if it has changed over the last 2,000 years? Well, some of these weird manuscripts, which are now translated into modern versions, have a lot of changes in them. The inerrant word of God, as given, was certainly authoritative. It came from the Holy Spirit. Through the amanuensis's that is, the scribes who wrote it down, the apostles and prophets. But then they died. So we have authority in the first generation, but do we have authority now? 
If God has not preserved his word, we have no authority. We have no standard. We have nothing to lead us into battle that explains to us who our God is and what he expects of us. Dear people, this is a critical issue. And yes, I believe that God has preserved his very words in the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic and has given to us faithful translation in our Bibles. I'm using the King James here. Dear people, you are in a battle. Many people will say, well, it doesn't matter what you use. You know, the idea is there. God did not inspire ideas. God inspired words. God inspired words in human language, not in some angelic language, not some kind of a tongues thing where you get new revelation. God inspired his word in real human language. And it reveals who he is perfectly and completely. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah our banner, how important that is. God told Moses to write it in a book. Now, God told Israel to go to war with Amalek. What has he commanded us to do? Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You've got a tricky enemy. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation. Now listen carefully here and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Interesting, Christ is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. The sword is what you do battle with. All the other is defensive armor. The sword is the only offensive weapon that you have. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. If you have error in one, what's to say you don't have error in the other? Is not Jesus Christ preserved sinless? Is he not perfect? Remember, folks, when there's an attack on the written word of God, it is an attack on Jesus Christ. For if one stands, the other stands. If one falls, the other falls. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, your spiritual warfare, just like Israel had warfare with Amalek, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me. Paul says, pray for me, the great apostle Paul, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. God has clearly commanded us to be engaged in spiritual warfare. But what is our standard? What is the rod of God held over the head of Moses? What is it that when it is lifted up to our view brings victory, and when it is lowered it brings defeat? God himself is the standard, and he has revealed himself to us in the Holy Scriptures. Let me go back to that picture of Jehovah Nisi for just a moment. God is the warrior banner leading his troops. What is the standard he has given us? How is it portrayed? His standard is definitely not portrayed as a basket of sweet-smelling advice on how to win friends and influence people. It is portrayed as a sword that is used in battle against the hosts of hell. Now, I'm going to give you an extended illustration here. Bear with me. It's a long illustration. I'll try to finish it before our time is up. But I'm going to give you an extended illustration because I think you will see the clear point as to why not only biblical inspiration but biblical preservation is essential 
to the biblical standards of God himself as the standard. Here's the illustration. In the United States, the question of national standards dates back to the initial union of the 13 original colonies. Both the Article, Articles of Confederation, ratified March 1st, 1781, and the Constitution of 1787, Article 1, Section 8, ratified March 4th, 1789, granted Congress the power to coin money, regulate the alloy and value of coin, and to fix the standards of weights and measures. Both George Washington in his first annual message to Congress and Thomas Jefferson in his office as Secretary of State in the Jefferson Report pressed diligently for a uniform system of weights and measures due to the multiple systems then in place in the international community. In 1824, Congress created the Office of Standard Weights and Measures. In 1836, it got transferred to the Secretary of Treasury. In 1838, the uniform set of basic standards was finalized, and in 1890, Congress established the Office of Construction of Weights and Measures. It changed again in 1894 to include units of electrical measure. In 1903, it was placed under the Department of Congress. In 1988, the name was changed again to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. That's what we have today. Now, most people, when they think of what they call the Bureau of Standards, normally think about mass and length, the, you know, those very special bars of rare metal that are kept in a specific temperature in a specific atmosphere inside a glass case in Washington, D.C. as the absolute standard for what is an inch, what is a foot, what is a meter, and all of that kind of stuff. How much is actually a troy ounce and so on. That's all, all there, and these, that's what we normally think of. But the Bureau of Standards has a lot more than that. It's developing new areas of standards for quality, safety, performance, precision measurement in radio technology, automotive technology, aviation, cryogenics, electronics, nuclear physics, space science. It's a benchmark for chemistry, biochemical engineering, chemical engineering, physics, information science, building and fire safety, construction, protection against natural disasters, winds, earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, microelectronics. I mean, I've got a great big long list here of all the things that they do. It's so important that Congress, back in 2002, commanded the NIST to conduct an investigation into the collapse of the World Trade Center, buildings one, two, and seven. The final report released in November 2008, that was six years later, concluded that the cause of building collapse in building seven was fire and not secondary explosions. People had theorized that there were additional bombs planted in the buildings by some. So you say, so what? Well, here is the specific point that I'm trying to make in relation to Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner or the Lord our standard and biblical standards. God prohibits double standards. There are too many Christians today who are trying to live by double standards, by a defective standard where they have removed certain things from Scripture or added things to Scripture and some other standard which they have tried to glue on to the scriptures. But God prohibits that. Leviticus 19.36 Just balances, just weight, just ephah, and a just hin shall you have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. So he's taking us in Leviticus 19 back to the text that we began with today. God meets Moses at the burning bush and says, I'm going to send you to Egypt and you're going to bring my people out. What do we find Leviticus tells us about that? God, at that point, said you are not going to have a double standard. Deuteronomy 25, 13, Thou shalt not have thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small. Proverbs 16, 11, A just weight and balance are the Lord's, Jehovah's. All the weights of the bag are his work. Chapter 20, verse 10, Diverse weights, diverse measures, both of them are alike abomination to the Lord. 20, verse 23 says the same thing. Micah 6.11, the same. There, there are many passages of scripture that deal with that. Jehovah, our banner. Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah, our standard. That goes before the troops. Does he tolerate a mixture of that which is evil and that which is good? Scripture declares certainly not. There are three principal ideas that are set out in these verses. Number one the principle of an ultimate single standard or banner. 
Number two, an authoritative source or benchmark for the standards that are under that standard. And three, a carefully preserved standard. If you are going to have a standard that has authority for you today, it has to meet those three qualifications according to Scripture. Those three principles apply to the exact preservation of the Word of God and its ultimate authority as our banner. God does not have a double standard, a triple standard, a fluctuating standard, or a quasi-defective standard stated in multiple ways in multiple variant manuscripts so that we can pick and choose to suit our own fancy. You know, when the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, promulgates by law a standard in the many different areas where they promote those standards, they are binding. If you don't have a specific ultimate authority as the standard, all of your subsidiary standards will be defective. If you have humanism plus God, as revealed in the Bible, you've got a double standard. If you have your emotions and the Bible running your life, you have a double standard. You will go wrong. If you have the world, the flesh, and the devil and the Bible on the one, uh, uh, the devil on one hand and the Bible on the other hand, and trying to weld those things together, you will go wrong. In fact, you'll not only go wrong, but you'll have some kind of a weird schizophrenic life of a hopeless hypocrite that brings shame to Christ and utter spiritual defeat. Well, I want to talk about the Bible and the standard of Jehovah Nissi, but our, and there are two divisions to that, but our time is gone. So if the Lord willing, we'll pick up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that you are Jehovah Nissi. You are the Lord, our banner, the Lord who is the standard that goes before the troops into battle, the Lord who has revealed himself in his word, write all these words in a book so that it can be rehearsed in the ears of Joshua, and Joshua is then commanded later on to rehearse them in the ears of the people. And that same responsibility passed on to the prophets and to the kings even, to have always a copy of the book of the law before them so that they would not pervert judgment and justice. There was a standard given so that God's people would be victorious in battle. Father, let us not lose our standard. Let us not let it fall into the hands of the enemy. Let us believe it. Let us follow it even to death. For you are the one who has revealed himself in that standard, the word of God. We pray, Father, that you will take this, your word, as it has been proclaimed today and use it to galvanize the hearts of your people for the spiritual battle to which you have called us, that we might not compromise with the world, the flesh, and the devil, but live holy lives that are pleasing to you, looking for the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who will ride as the word of God back to earth to judge it, for its wickedness, and we following him. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. How we thank you for him, whose name is the word of God. How we thank you for him, who has a sharp sword that goes out of his mouth, with which he smites all of the nations. The sword of the Spirit, the word of God. Father, bless this your word to our hearts and make us obedient to it. Cause us to believe it and to follow precisely the standard that you have set before us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.